Um, it was in New York. Um, I grew up in New York. I was born in Finland, actually, but I was one year old when I came to New York. And um, um, I always liked um, all kinds of music with African influence, African American, Caribbean. I loved um, like Afro-Cuban music, and I was listening to like Latin jazz groups. And then when I was in my early 20s, we, I was playing in a Latin jazz group, but we didn't really have um, too many gigs. We were just rehearsing, you know. And my friends said, "Wow, you know, you play saxophone. You could get gigs playing merengue." And I said, "Merengue? What's that? I never heard of that." And they said, "It's a different kind of music." And um, I said, "Well, oh." And they said, "Well, that's from the Dominican Republic." And I said, "Where? What's that? You know?" And um, they said, "Don't you know? That's completely different. That doesn't sound like Cuban music." And I said, "Really?" And they said, "And plus, it uses a lot of saxophones." So then I started playing in some little groups here and there, and there was a demand for saxophonists then because that was the boom of merengue, you know. And there weren't, there were um, not that many people that really were playing, you know, enough people to fill all the slots, you know, for the bands and stuff. So I played with local, like, semi-professional bands, and um, I played a few gigs with Joseito Mateo, and um, I played some gigs with a really good musician, who, uh, Victor Wai, who is an arranger, and he worked with... Um, with Frito Vargas and stuff. So I played with some decent groups, and so I really got into it. And um, I love the way that the saxophone performs a rhythmic function in the music, you know? So it's not like just always playing the melody. The sax is, is used like a drum, you know? It's used the same way that, and I love drums. So I thought, wow, but I'm never going to be a, as good a drummer as all these great drummers. But I play saxophone, so I can play the rhythms on the sax. And it doesn't matter if it's a drum or a sax. What I liked was that catchy rhythm, you know. So I love the jaleos, you know, which are the riffs of merengue, the, the, the rhythmic part of merengue. I loved it. So I got into that. And then I went to grad school um, for ethnomusicology, and I decided to do my dissertation on merengue and then wrote a book about it. Uh, jazz is a form of African-American music that um, you, is, um, has um, as a central feature improvisation. There was this inf influence of jazz on Dominican music. So it wasn't really like similar to the jazz here. It was just some influences, you know. That was already started in the 1920s. But when Davito Vasquez, the saxophonist who played... Um, who was from Santiago, but he moved to the capital to play in La Voz Dominicana, which was a radio station that was sponsored by Trujillo, the dictator, um, you know, from 1936 to 61. Davito Vasquez started really using um, very high-level bebop improvisation within merengue and blending Dominican music with jazz. So um, that was very different. Um, jazz was the dominant form of, of popular music in the United States and actually the world, you know, like in the 1920s, 1930s, up until the 50s, you know, like the big bands, all those, those influences of those, um, the dances that came out of the U.S., like the Foxtrot, the One Step, the Two Step, those were the popular music of the day. That was like hip-hop today or rock and roll. So that spread all around the world, not just the Dominican Republic. And... Um, for example, Luis Alberti, who was the leader of the band um, that Trujillo chose to be the, the, you know, the, his personal band in 1936, um, Luis Alberti's first band was called Jazz Band Alberti. Now, that doesn't mean they really played jazz, but they played a kind of jazz-influenced music, you know. So they had some jazz influences, just because all over the world that was the big thing fad. So sort of like hip hop today, you know, people play it all over the world. So they were doing jazz all over the world. So including the Dominican Republic. Chirujillo really supported music. So um, there were a lot of resources for people to study different kinds of music and stuff like that. And he supported all these different bands, different kinds of or um, orchestras and small groups. And they played Mexican music. They played all these different kinds of music, tango, everything, you know. Um, symphonic music he supported. So 
um, the music, there was a lively music scene at the radio station La Voz Dominicana. And um, so the musicians started listening to records from the U.S., you know, and, and teaching each other about jazz. And um, so it wasn't just Tavito Vasquez. Tavito was just kind of like the best of them. But there were a lot of people. Hector de Leon was a trumpet player who a lot of people talked about and said that he was the person that really turned them on to jazz. Now, the interesting thing is Trujillo didn't allow people to, to travel very much, hardly at all. So they weren't traveling to the U.S. and learning about jazz here. And there weren't a lot of jazz musicians going there either. So they kind of um, were limited to whatever records they could get a hold of, you know what I mean? So when Mario Rivera, the great saxophonist, Dominican saxophonist who came here in the early 60s, came here, he had been listening to the jazz records that he had heard at La Voz Dominicana from his friends, but there was a very limited thing. So he had heard of a lot of the West Coast jazz artists, like Zoot Sims and Stan Getz or whatever, but, um, but he hadn't heard of like some of the greats, you know, um, just because the Dominican Republic was so isolated that it was kind of weird, like chance, like what they ended up listening to, you know. Basically, the point of that article is that there, that in spite of the of the really intense Eurocentrism, Eurocentrism of Dominican identity. In other words, in spite of the fact that um, people identify with their European ancestors in Europe and don't identify with their African ancestors as a whole, that I think I can make that generalization. Um, the musicians in the Dominican Republic have, for a long time, um, connected with um, African American music from the United States. So they were making this connection in, as part of the African diaspora um, musically at a time when in verbal discourse, in what people could actually say, you know, talk about, or even think about, they were, couldn't do that. So, the, so their conscious identity was a, one of negating connections to other black people around the world. But musically, because music speaks its own language, so they were making connections with African American music, musicians. Not only African American musicians, one of the most important um, pieces of Dominican uh, music that was fused with jazz, I don't know if I would call it Dominican jazz, but it's a merengue piece that has a lot of jazz influence, was um, arranged by Felix de Rosario, and it's an arrangement of a song that was made popular by Louis Armstrong called Skokian. But um, that Skokian is not uh, um, uh, composed by Louis Armstrong, it was, it's a South African song, or actually from South East Africa, from like Zimbabwe around there, that became popular. And then Louis Armstrong recorded it, and then it be became popular, really popular. And then Felix de Rosario heard it and did his version. But when I interviewed Felix, he didn't know that it was an African song. He just had heard Louis Armstrong's version. And <clears throat> in fact, he thought it was some kind of Caribbean, like French Caribbean influence on it or something. And it was only after I did my research that he found out that his own arrangement was an African one. But the thing is that that doesn't matter was a, an arrangement of an African song. It doesn't matter because his, his ears knew the connection. So, the muse, so that song is a co co combination of Dominican music, North American jazz, and African music. And um, so these connections were being made, and he did that during the era of Trujillo, in the last years of the dictatorship. So even while Trujillo was denying these Afro-diaspora connections, and even at a time when if you spoke against Trujillo, it was very dangerous for you. The musicians could do it in another way because they don't have to say it with words. They can just say it through music and they don't even have to know that they're saying it because, there's, because the ancestors or the deep spiritual part of you knows that that's happening even if in words you can't say it. So like another um, musician who influenced me a lot, Tony Vicioso, a composer who does a lot of fusion between Afro-Dominican music, 
and jazz, actually, in a, in a later, more modern sense, who's very active today, um, told me um, that when I go to the Dominican Republic, he didn't really think that it was the best idea to openly, even today, um, talk, I mean, yeah, talk about the um, way that Haitians are continually persecuted in the Dominican Republic, or to openly, on stage, make a lot of really political comments about it. Although, I have heard him do that, too, so I don't think that there's anything wrong with that, actually. But he said that even, even though that may be good at times, <coughs> yeah, an even better way to address that um, problem that Dominicans have with Haitians is through music. Because you don't even have to say it. So if you do a Haitian-Dominican Haitian fusion piece, you're already making a political statement. And it's more, it'll get over better with certain people than if you just talk or give a speech about it. So I think that music can perform that function. Now the situation is a little different, but um, when Trujillo was alive and they were doing those experiments, I think it um, wasn't as different as we might think. The issues are still the same. The issue is still that Dominican identity is very Eurocentric and that these fusions between Dominican music and other Afro-diasporic musics can be a way to address that situation. Ha <laughs> ha.